Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Jason Inman. And I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University, where we take one character, construct, or really exciting person from popular culture and teach you everything that you need to know about it in about an hour. And this week, we are talking about my main man, the thing I am most excited for in the Marvel Universe. We are talking about Luke. Cage. The thing you are the most excited about on the Marvel Universe? In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, which I do count the Netflix series as I know that there's necessarily not a strict correlation They've been there. said that they're not a part, which um, I think is terrible. Luke Cage is literally, of all the things that Marvel has announced on their docket, the thing I'm most looking for. All right. <laughs> and it's too. too bad, because I really do want to see Mike Coulter, Luke Cage, talk to Chris Evans. I think, I think it could happen. Okay, well, we're going to talk about Luke Cage this week, because we saw him in the first season of Jessica Jones on Netflix, and his self-titled Netflix show show will premiere this week on Woo! September 30th, or if you're listening to this in the far, far future, maybe it's already on Netflix and you've already enjoyed it, and you're enjoying Luke Cage Season 5. I was like, I was thinking <laughs> Season 5, that's so cool. Uh, this lesson was suggested by one of our awesome students, Anthony Russell, so thank you for just suggesting Luke Cage, Anthony. Thanks, Tony. I'm going to call you Tony. Uh, that works in the Marvel Universe. So let's move <laughs> on into the first section of our podcast, the Ten Cent Origin. Yes, and the Ten Cent Origin is where we bake, break down all the basic... We also bake. We bake them we bake them down mm-hmm. uh the basic constructs power sets creators and all the cool stuff you need to know for when you go to that sweet sweet cocktail party in harlem and someone's like let's wrap about luke cage uh, luke cage of course is published by marvel comics his first appearance was in luke cage hero for hire number <laughs> one in june of 1972 he was created by archie goodwin the writer john ramita senior the artist very famous artist yes. and george tusca a very famous artist as well his real name is Carl Lucas and his <laughs> team affiliations have been the Avengers, the Heroes for Hire, the Fantastic Four, the Defenders, the Marvel Knights, and the Thunderbolts. And his partnerships have been with Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, and Misty Knight. Nice. His notable aliases have been Power Man. That's it. And his <laughs> And his abilities are superhuman strength, unbreakable skin, and he has an accelerated healing factor. He's so badass, he only needs one alien. That's right, and he doesn't like it half the time. So let's move on into the meet cute, Ashley. Yes, the meet cute is the part of the podcast that we stole from romantic comedy writing, where we tell you the first time we met this character and how cute it was. Well, Ashley, I am very curious about your meet cute (laughs) for Luke Cage. I Uh hope it's not the Netflix series, but where Uh did you meet... Luke Cage. It was not the Netflix series. Um, I did not have a ton of exposure to Luke Cage, though, until the Netflix series. I'd never read any of his solo titles before. Um, I have now. I've read a couple of them. And um, the first place that I remember meeting him, this is kind of my catch-all for my Marvels. This is my Batman, the animated series of the Marvel Universe, uh, was Civil War. Because Interesting. Civil War was was the crossover that had like every, not every, but basically every character from the Marvel Universe, and many of them I'd never seen before. I didn't know who Jessica Jones and Luke Cage were. Uh, I thought Luke Cage looked very handsome, and I was down for that, and he had a baby, and that's like as much thought as I In the comic book, you thought Luke Cage was handsome? Yeah, he's, okay. a, he's, a, very, he's a very attractive African-American man. Sure. Luke Cage has never not, not been good looking. Okay. Scientific fact. Great. Uh, so yeah. So when it's I, one of his superpowers. Yeah, he's never good. not good looking. Never not good looking. All right. I'd go with that. Yeah. So so. Civil War is where I first Added to the him. list. Yes. So how about you? Where did you first meet uh, Mr. Luke Cage? Well, Ashley, let me tell you of a time in Comics Pass, <laughs> a time of Comics Pass known as Heroes Reborn. Ah, now, if, one, of the, one of the staples of our yep. meet Now, if you know in the year 1996, 19, long, 1990. long time ago, in the old timey times, um, <laughs> <laughs> the Avengers and the Fantastic Four and Iron Man and the Hulk were shunted off into this pocket dimension where Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld could basically do whatever they want to him. Iron Man got tailpipes, uh, the Hulk got long hair, and Captain America put the shield emblem on his head and it looked real dumb. Yeah, one of those sounds like a really exciting prospect. The other one sounds like a yeah. less exciting prospect, and I'll leave that up to you. So during that entire year, of course, the regular Marvel Universe still continued on, mm-hmm. and Marvel published some titles during during that time to basically fill the hole for the regular Marvel heroes. Thunderbolts was launched during that time period. Beloved of Jason Inman. Yes. So was a new updated series called Heroes for Hire, mm-hmm. which was an update of the original concept. Now, it had some great art. Written by John Ostrander, famous creator of the Suicide Squad. Dun, dun, dun. And 
this series really caught my attention because okay. uh, they had an updated Power Man costume, and of course, Danny Rand, the Iron Fist, one of my favorites, was standing front and center, and it was the first time I'd ever read the Heroes for Hire. Nice. And that is my first uh, conceit and concept of Luke Cage. Now, Luke was doing some shady stuff during that series. Mm-hmm. We will get to that in this lesson. We will talk about that series. Um, but I will tell you this, that series has now showed up on Marvel Unlimited, and it's okay. <laughs> it's a, it, it's definitely a 90s book, but that's where I first encountered but, Luke Cage. But for you, it was a it was a perfectly fine introduction to the character. Well, you know, I will say that that series, uh, and when we ever get to our Iron Fist lesson, that series cemented my Danny Rand love. Cool. Very for cool. For Iron Fist. Uh, I thought Luke Cage was all right. But to me, you can't have Iron Fist without Luke Cage. You can't have Luke Cage without Iron Fist. They are Batman and Robin to me. Oh, so that's nice. They are the bestest of friends. All right. Let's move on to the History 101, the main meat of the lesson where Professor Jason is going to drop us right in the middle of the pool. That is Luke Cage. That's right. And I'm also, at any time, I'm going to be shouting out to Anthony Russell, our TA, who suggested this awesome lesson. Mm-hmm. Okay. So a little bit of publication history before we get into the fictional character history. Great. Luke Cage, like I said before, created by Archie Goodwin and John Romita Sr. Shortly after the black exploitation films emerged as a popular new genre, he is a direct result of all of those films. Cool. So he debuted in his own series called Luke Cage Hero for Hire, which was initially written by Goodwin and penciled by George Tuska. Now, Cage's adventures during this series were set during a grungier, more crime-dominated New York City mm-hmm. um, than other Marvel heroes experienced. So the Fantastic Four's New York was different from it's Luke a, a Cage's very, New York. They live in a very clean New York City. Yes. I will, uh, yes. Now, the series was soon retitled to Luke Cage Power Man with issue number 17. Ooh. And as the black exploitation genre's popularity faded, uh, Cage became unable to support a series by himself. So they soon paired him with another superhero whose popularity was also based on a declining film genre, <laughs> the martial arts film genre, and thus the Power Man Iron Fist title was born, which is what the Luke Cage series became at issue number 50 in 1978. I want to be in the room where the editors are like, hey, these two titles aren't (laughs) doing very well. Why don't we team them up? (laughs) Like, we're not going to throw in an Iron Man. We're not going to throw in Captain America. Let's just put these two guys alone in their own little corner. My biggest question is, is that why didn't we get a comic book that was a direct result of the failing uh, 1950s ray gun and Western genre? Oh, man. I think, sp- I think those comics already failed by this point. We're, we're, we're Spaceman and Cowboy Kid. Spaceman and Cowboy Kid. Copyright <laughs> Geek History Lesson coming next year. <laughs> now, I will say that when the series was retitled uh, Power Man and Iron Fist, it did ran another uh, almost 10 years. Wow. To 1986. It was canceled at 125. And the series final writer, James Owsley, attempted to shed Cage's exploitation roots by giving him a larger vocabulary and reducing his usage of the, ca- the catchphrase is, is Famous catchphrase, Sweet Christmas. That even made its way to Netflix. Now, I will say again, you might have noticed I said vocabulary. Luke Cage was given a very limited vocabulary when he first showed up. That is true. So we'll talk a little bit, a little bit more about the publication history as we move on. But let's get into the character's fictional history. All right. Lay it on me. Carl Lucas, the man who would one day be known as Luke Cage, was (laughs) born and raised in the streets of the New York district of Harlem. He was the son of Esther and James Lucas. And James Lucas was a retired New York police detective. Nice. Now, uh... Carl Lucas spent his youth causing trouble on the streets with his friends Willis Stryker and Reva Connors. And Lucas eventually joined a gang called the Rivals, along with his best friend Stryker. Mm-hmm. And he fought the rival gang, the Diablos, and committed various petty thefts, often on behalf of the deformed crime lord, Sonny Caputo, a.k.a. Hammer. He sort of like loosely controlled the Rivals. Okay. Okay. Now, Carl was in and out of juvenile homes throughout his teams, and he dreamed of becoming a major New York racketeer until he finally realized that his criminal actions were hurting his family. So he dreamed of becoming like the big man, the man who controlled New York. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And he sought to better himself as an adult because he realized he was hurting his family and he wanted to really find legitimate employment. Meanwhile, while he was turning uh, a new leaf, mm-hmm. Stryker rose through the ranks of crime, but the two Stryker. men remained friends. Aw. However, Stryker's activities came to the attention of the Magia, a.k.a. the Syndicate, who did not appreciate his activities, and he was badly attacked in a mob hit. But 
Carl Lucas was there to save him. Yay! Yep. After that, Reva ended her relationship with Stryker and turned to Carl Lucas for comfort. This caused a rift between the two former friends, and Stryker believed Lucas was the cause of the breakup. Ah. Oh. So, Stryker planted heroin stolen from Cotton Mouse organization in Lucas's place and tipped off the cops. Carl Lucas was arrested, sentenced to prison, and he attempted to get revenge by contacting the Magia only for the group's attempt on Stryker's life to go awry, awry excuse me, while Stryker survived and Reva was killed in the process. So, Carl Lucas was being sent to prison. Just the recap here real quick. Yeah. He was like, screw Stryker. I'm going to screw him over. He called the bad guys who wanted to get after Stryker. The bad guys failed. And in the process, <sighs> they killed their childhood friend, Reva. That's a lot of heavy. I mean, it's it's a great it's mm-hmm. a great origin story, but he didn't even have superpowers yet. <laughs> he does not have superpowers. Now, Lucas is on his way to prison. Okay. And he lost contact with his family due to the resentment of his brother, James Jr., who intercepted his brother's letters from prison to their father and eventually led the other to believe they were dead. Mm. So Carl thought his dad was dead. His dad thought Carl was dead. Okay. Okay. All because James Jr. was like, ah, Lucas, you went to prison. Mm." Aw. That's 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 my James Jr. impression. Okay. I don't know why. (laughs) Uh, While in prison, Lucas was consumed with hatred and rage by his friend's betrayal and the supposed loss of his father. Mm -hmm. And he spent time getting into brawls along with various escape attempts, none of which were successful. But because of this, he was transferred to Seagate Prison, uh, also makers of the hard drive. No, joke. (laughs) He was uh, transferred to Seagate. Bad joke. I'm sorry. That was funny. He was transferred to Seagate Prison, one of the toughest facilities off the coast of Georgia. Now, Dr. Noah Bernstein, he came to that prison, CK prison, to carry out secret medical research and recruited Carl Lucas as a volunteer. Mm. Now, what they didn't know is that Dr. Noah was secretly working on an experimental cell regeneration based on a variant of the super soldier serum. Now, Ashley. Yes, Jason. What is is the super soldier serum famous for in the Marvel Universe. It's famous for making Steve Rogers attractive and turning him into Captain America. Captain America. Uh, And a bunch of other people, but most famously, Steve Rogers. Now, Dr. Noah immersed Lucas in an electrical field conducted by an organic chemical compound. Science! However, (laughs) when he left the equipment unattended, Billy Bob Rackham who had been giving Lucas grief up to this point. I legitimately thought you were going to say Billy Bob Thornton. Nope. Uh, He might have a beef with Carl Lucas as well. Uh, I do not have the research to support that. (laughs) So Billy Bob Rackham, who had been giving Lucas grief up to this point, Mm. tampered with the controls, hoping to kill Lucas. (gasps) However, the treatment was accelerated past its intended purpose, causing a mutagenic change throughout Lucas's body, fortifying his cells and giving him superhero strength and durability. Carl Lucas, with his newfound powers, used them to escape the prison and make his way back to Harlem, where after a chance encounter with some criminals, it gave him the idea to start protecting people for money. Now, Carl, of course, was still a wanted man, so he had to adopt the alias Luke Cage. I was wondering where that came from. And now that he had powers, he decided to don a distinctive costume, the yellow shirt and the tiara, Mm -hmm. and start a new career as a hero for hire. And he would help anyone who could meet his price. Nice. Now, he found an office in Times Square's Gem Theater. In Times Square? Yeah, right? Wow, Broadway. This is the 70s. Still. Times Square was not the nicest of places. Yeah, but it's still Broadway. There you go. (laughs) Luke Cage on Broadway. Well, he he set up shop in the Gem Theater, which was owned by film student D.W. Griffith, who was a relative of the original D.W. Griffith. Yes, yes, Very famous. Now, later, Dr. Bernstein also relocated to New York and opened the storefront clinic assisted by Dr. Claire. Temple. Now, Ashley, does Dr. Claire Temple, does that name sound familiar? It rings a distinctly Rosario Dawson-shaped bell. That is correct. That is the character that Rosario Dawson plays in all the Netflix series, Claire Temple. Yes. Okay. Now, Luke Cage first met Claire after he was attacked by Hitman, hired by his old friend, Stryker. And when Claire rushed to help him, she was shocked to find that he wasn't injured by the attack and insisted on having her colleague look at his, look at his bruises. And at the clinic... Luke realized that her colleague was Dr. Noah Bernstein, the guy that gave him superpowers. Mm. 
So the guy's like, I was pretty successful. Good for me. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> Science. Yeah, comics. Yep. <laughs> now, Claire was soon kidnapped, and Luke tracked her to her perpetrator's lair, where he was surprised to find that it was his old friend and betrayer, Stryker. The two former friends fought Cage, who hoped to clear his name. However, during the fight, Stryker fell through a skylight and was blown up uh, by one of his old own trick switchblades. Just go with it. Oh, my God. Uh, ruining any hope that Luke Cage had that Stryker could clear his name. Stryker's a terrible friend. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, soon after a ghostly attack at the Gem Theater in the middle of the night, Luke confronted Daily Bugle reporter Phil Fox, who was interested in doing a piece about Cage. Cool. However, Luke refused... But this only furthered this reporter's interest in the hero for hire. Luke was next hired by Jasper Brunt to investigate the Phantom of 45th Street. And while investigating it, Luke learned that the Phantom was actually Armand Lorning, the son of Brunt's former business partner. And I would have gotten away for it, too, if it weren't for those mm-hmm. meddling kids. The two men fought, but of course, they fell out the window and Armand was killed. What? And soon, Luke was hired as a hero for hire from one of Marvel Comics' most famous villains. Ashley, would you care to guess what villain hired Luke Cage? Can I can I have a hint? No, just guess. <laughs> Galactus. Uh, no, <laughs> Galactus does not believe in the concept of money. He only believes in the betterment of himself by eating plants. <laughs> well, if he ate Luke Cage, he'd be a better self. That's true. Uh, the villain who hired Luke Cage was Doctor Doom. Oh, I was going to guess the Kingpin too. I would exclamation I would... point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Written in a really big font. Yep. Uh, Kingpin's a good guess. Thank you. Yep. Now, Doctor Doom, the ruler of Latveria, hired Luke to defeat a bunch of rogue Doombots who had disguised themselves as African American New Yorkers. Oh yeah, that's a real problematic issue. <laughs> It's kind of like when Lois Lane becomes African American for an issue. Yep. yep. Luke took the job and destroyed the Doombots with ease. However, Doctor Doom skipped town without paying Luke his two hundred dollar fee. Yeah. Now here's the thing. <laughs> Doctor Doom paid Luke Cage two hundred dollars. Promised to pay Luke Cage two hundred dollars. He promised to pay him two hundred dollars. Luke Cage is setting his fee low, I think, for fighting a bunch of robots. Well, it's the seventies, so you got to adjust for inflation. That's true. So Luke Cage borrowed the Fantastic Four's uh, jet. He flew to Latveria, and he beat. <laughs> Can he fly a plane? <laughs> he did, baby. He did. I guess. And he <laughs> beat the living hell out of Doctor Doom until Doctor Doom paid him <laughs> yes. his two hundred dollars. Yeah. So if you want to Google that, you can find Luke Cage beating the snot out of Dr. Doom. After Luke Cage was paid, he left Dr. Doom in peace and returned to the States. (laughs) (laughs) So the lesson is, you best pay up to Luke Cage, damn it. Oh, my God. I just imagine the customs agent is like, you only left an hour ago. I was like, I have got no more business. (laughs) No, no, no. The customs agent is like, do you have anything to declare? I got this $200. Uh, We're going to have to take that, Mr. Cage. Uh, Son of a... (laughs) We don't trade well with Latveria, so you got to pay your tariff. <laughs> yeah, what if Doctor Doom paid him a lot varying money, and the exchange rate is like nothing? What's the lot varying money? Is it like a kroner or something like that? Let's just say a ruble. A ru- <laughs> don't think that exists anymore. I don't know. That's why it's Latverian money. <laughs> All, All right. right. Headcanon accepted. Yep. Rubles. So after a time, Luke returned to his office to find a package waiting for him. Inside the package were two live venomous snakes. I was hoping it was Iron Fist. Nope. Luke easily defeated them and tied them both to... <laughs> yes, he defeated the snakes. <laughs> Ooh, snakes. I will defeat them. <laughs> well, he defeated them by tying them together. I like Hercules. That's yep. good. And he tossed them aside. Like Hercules. Now, D.W. Griffith entered the office, <laughs> attracted by the commotion, and informed <laughs> Luke that he had visitors. Two large men walked in and introduced themselves as Mike and Ike. I'm not joking. Stop. The duo noticed that Luke had received their boss's gift and wondered if Luke would appreciate his offer as well. Luke grew annoyed and grabbed Mike, demanding to know who they work for. And after a brief fight, Luke threatened to shove the two snakes down Mike's throat if he didn't give up his boss's name. (laughs) This is awesome. Getting the answers he needed, Luke traveled to the Midtown office of the drug kingpin known as Cornell Cottonmouth. Mm. Now, Cottonmouth explained that he'd sent the snakes as a test to see if Luke was worried Worthy of a position in his organization's hierarchy. And Luke, very suspicious, of course, um, he was very suspicious that, of course, this heroin mm-hmm. and any kind of drugs mm-hmm. would be used to frame him and would basically allow him to be sent back to prison. Yeah. So Luke decided to take the job 
reasoning that he would have a better chance at clearing his name if he was on the inside of Cotton Mouth's organization. I don't agree with him, but okay. Just go with it. He fights snakes. <laughs> he beats up uh, dictators in, in Eastern Europe. Go and, with it. And, and works for drug dealers. So for his first mission, Luke was sent to retrieve a shipment of heroin that was stolen by Boss Morgan's gang. Luke, su- Luke succeeded and was fully welcomed into Cotton Mouse organization. Now, over the following days, Cotton Mouse uh, assistant, Mr. Slick, showed Luke the ins and outs of the operation. And during this time, Luke hoped to find records of Cotton Mouse dealings that could clear his name uh, to the cops, but he couldn't find anything. So he was growing increasingly frustrated by his lack of process. So Luke eventually decided just to call the cops, figuring that there had to be records somewhere and then maybe the cops could shut down the organization. Mm. During this, Cottonmouth learned of Luke's betrayal and attacked him. And during that fight, Mr. Slick was accidentally knocked out of the window and plummeted 35 stories to his death. Wow. Distraught with Mr. Slick's death, Cottonmouth surrendered. And Luke demanded that Cottonmouth show him his records, a request that Cottonmouth laughed at. Now, Cottonmouth then told Luke that Mr. Slick, his good friend, the man who had just died, had a photographic memory of his records. And Luke knocked Cottonmouth out, realizing that he had destroyed the only piece of evidence he would have had to Mm. put Cottonmouth in jail. So now, the reason I told you about this story is that in the Netflix series, um, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Mar- Marshala Ali? Marshala, yeah. Marshala Ali, who is uh, from House of Cards, played Remy on House of Cards. Yes. He is playing Cornell Cottonmouth Stokes in the Netflix series. So I have a feeling that you may see some effects of this comic story in the show. Mm. And it would not surprise me if we meet a Mr. Slick, very similar relationship to Wesley yes. in the Daredevil season one. We don't know. Haven't seen the show yet at the time of this recording. Uh, if you're watching this from the future and you're calling us idiots. Uh, That's not very nice. That's what I say to you. Shortly after that, Luke Cage began associating, associating, associating. and associating with the loose knit super team known as the Defenders. Yeah. Alongside whom he fought the super strong wrecking crew and the racist subversives known as the Sons of the Serpent. Yes. <laughs> now, Ashley, who are the Defenders? The Defenders are your very street level, mostly associated with Harlem, New York brand Marvel characters. Um, Made up of uh, Chang Chi, Iron Fist, Colleen Wing, Misty Knight, Luke Cage. There's been a bunch of other people, but those are the characters that tend to be the staples. Uh, that is completely incorrect. Oh well, there that you go. is is what the probably the Netflix version of the Defenders will be. Maybe but the, I'm confusing with the Fearless. The Defenders, defenders are usually a Doctor Strange, Hulk, Namor. Oh, you're right. Uh, Silver Surfer team. Um, I'm I'm all new, all different. Yep. Fearless Defenders. Now Doctor Sorry, Strange guys. and the Hulk are usually consistently the members, along with a number of the mainstays in the '70s, which included Valkyrie, Nighthawk, Hellcat, Hellcat, Hell, I love Hellcat. Gargoyle, Beast from the X-Men, and Son of Satan. Beast. Really? Really? Yep. I didn't know that. Yeah, in the 70s, uh, Beast was part of the, uh, the Defenders. That's weird. Now, if you don't know who the Wrecking Crew is, they're a team of four fictional supervillains, the Bulldozer, Pile Driver, Thunderball, and the Wrecker. There you go. They're all of all the names of superheroes little boys love. Mm-hmm. They fight the Thor a lot. Yes. Uh, now, Luke was called to assist the Defenders against the Plant Man, and Cage began to complain that his participation in their group was interfering with his paying work. I gotta pay the bills! Uh, wealthy Defenders member Nighthawk solved this problem by placing Cage on retainer, giving Luke a steady paycheck for his Defenders activities. And for some time, Luke Cage served as a core member of the Defenders, alongside, at that time, his team was Doctor Strange, the Hulk, the Valkyrie, Nighthawk, the Red, and the Red Guardian. I think that's interesting that um, all of your sort of upper tier Marvel super teams uh, have a payroll. Yeah. Including Avengers. <laughs> Together, they defeated minor threats, including the eel and the porcupine and major menaces. <laughs> Menaces, also known as the Headman and Nebulon. The Um, porcupine. Now, Cage felt really out of place in these often bizarre exploits of the Defenders. And he eventually resigned from the team because Luke Cage believed he was unsuited to teamwork. Aw, bummer. But how little he would know, Ashley. Exactly. That we all do a little better with some teamwork. Or as I like to call it, a little help from our friends. Like the teamwork and help that some of you can give us over at patreon.com slash Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N. For as little as $1 a month, you can help keep the Mind University running smoothly and get yourself some perks like listening to GHL one day early at the what? $3 level or getting to enjoy the Patreon-exclusive podcast Geek, Geek History Lesson Extra, or as, exactly. I, or as I said it in the EO language, 
<laughs> so we have a Patreon exclusive podcast called GHL Extra, which we recently got a review of on Facebook that I want to read on the podcast. Ooh. Sam Martini, Martinez on Facebook, he wrote of Geek History Lesson Extra. I want you all to check out Geek History Lesson Extra. It's fun, highly entertaining, and really fills the need for a podcast fix when you don't have any standard episodes to listen to. And it also harkens back to the early episodes when Professor Ashley would drop a couple F and S bombs. <laughs> it is fantastic. I'm glad that those are uh, bringing in the listeners. Harken back to the old days of, of, of the your... The bygone days of cursing. Of Ashley's <laughs> cursing. So I want to really quickly uh, sh- throw a shout out to Sam. Thank you, Sam. And if you have the means, go be like Sam over at patreon.com slash Jawin. And we thank you all over at Patreon for the support. Now back to Luke Cage and talking about him and teamwork. Heck yeah. So, as I said, Luke Cage needs to learn a little bit about teamwork. He does. And he's going to get that from his future best friend, Danny Rand, the Iron Fist. Is that how you say it? I don't know. Do you say? Should I say it like Mortal Kombat? I'd be like the Iron Fist. And you should say it like the Iron Chef, where when he's announcing how do they the say ingredients, it? it's all, you have to be like the Iron Fist. It has to be like okay. very dramatic. Danny Rand, the Iron Fist. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh man, we're gonna blow out everybody with headphones. Sorry. All right, here we go. Now, Luke Cage during this time he obtained proof. Um, excuse me. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I almost spoiled a little bit of the lesson. Ooh, going we got ahead. we got all excited yeah. announcing Iron Fist presence. Okay. Yeah, I love it. I love Iron Fist. Sorry, <laughs> we're gonna back up a little bit. I almost spoiled a storyline. Here we go. The criminal Bushmaster. Oh, I know a little bit about this person. He obtained proof of Cage's innocence, mm-hmm. and he abducted Doctor Bernstein and Claire Temple, using their safety in the hope of acquittal to blackmail Luke Cage into abducting Detective Misty Knight, who had humiliated Bushmaster in an earlier encounter. Ashley. Who is Misty Knight in one sentence? Misty Knight is the coolest girl with an afro in the Marvel Universe who has a bionic arm and is a defender. Now, why should we care about Misty Knight? Well, two, three reasons. Oh, three? Uh, Three whole reasons. One, because there aren't enough amazing African-American women in comics and Misty Knight is freaking amazing. Very valid point. Uh, Two, because she is going to be appearing in the Luke Cage Netflix Marvel series. And three, because I'm teaching a lesson on her next Next week. Next week. Woo! So, more on Misty Knight to come. Yes. Now... Luke first met after this Danny Rand, aka the Iron Fist. <laughs> this is my favorite. So good. <laughs> a native was that good? That's so good. Okay. It's my favorite. <laughs> so he first met the Iron Fist, a native of the extra-dimensional city of Kunlun, and still a newcomer to Earth society because Danny grew up in Kunlun. Yes, I learned that recently. Yep. Um, he met him at a party celebrating his exoneration of all the charges. So Luke Cage got the charges dropped, mm-hmm. uh, but they were soon attacked by Stiletto and Discus teaming up to take them down. Now Cage's F efforts led to a fight with Iron Fist. However, upon learning of Cage's situation with the blackmailing, Iron Fist and Misty Knight Mm -hmm. helped him defeat Bushmaster and rescue his friends, creating a team-up that still exists in the Marvel Universe. It sure does. Iron Fist and Luke Cage. And Misty Knight sometimes. <laughs> and, and Misty Knight sometimes. So Cage and Iron Fist achieved great success with Heroes for Hire, and they earned an international reputation while fighting a wide variety of criminals, including the genius Nightshade, the international crime lord Montenegro, Sabretooth, the constrictor Warhawk, and the drug lord Goldeneye, not the James Bond movie. <laughs> and they occasionally worked alongside fellow street level heroes such as Spider-Man, Daredevil, and Moon Knight, mm-hmm. but they rarely ever participated in large scale crises like the Fantastic Four Avenger events. Okay. Yeah. However, their adventures did take some occasional turns towards the extraterrestrial and the extra dimensional areas, which sometimes had little to no appeal to the down to earth cage. <laughs> He's just so. like nuts to this magic stuff. <laughs> but like everything, all good things must come to an end. Say it ain't so, Jason. Yep. And their partnership's downfall began when the mysterious governmental agency known as Smile manipulated (laughs) Cage and Iron Fist into the employment of the Consolidated Conglomerates Incorporated. And during their first assignment for CCI, Iron Fist contracted radiation poisoning. Now, Luke Cage took him to Kun Loon for treatment, and while there, Iron Fist was unknown to Cage, replaced by a doppelganger of the plant-like Hulukup! I don't know how to say this word. It's H-Y-L-T-H-R-I. So I'm just going to say, Halithri, race. Sure. 
they are actually this uh, plant like race, Kun Lun's ancient enemies. Okay. Yeah. So they're Iron Fist bad guys. Yep. Got it. Soon after Luke Cage and Iron Fist return to the outside world, and this is Doppelganger Iron Fist. Right. The Doppelganger was destroyed when he was pummeled by the alien Super Scroll as a result <laughs> of the bizarre scheme engineered by Iron Fist arch enemy Master Khan. And Cage was blamed for this apparent murder of Iron Fist. Yes, he was. Yep, and it's kind of silly. It's really silly. (laughs) Now, Luke Cage, he can't get no breaks. He's a fugitive again, (laughs) and he's a fugitive because of his best friend's death. So he broke contact with his New York friends and relocated to Chicago. Chicago's cool. Yep. But with Jaron Hogarth's help, a lawyer friend of Danny Rand, Mm -hmm. he was cleared of criminal charges when the real Iron Fist, Danny Rand, turned up alive. Mm Mm-hmm. However, wanting a new start, Cage abandoned his Power Man guys and began operating out of Chicago as the plainclothes Luke Cage hero for hire. Yes. It was during this time also Luke tried to locate his surviving family members with the aid of Dakota North, and his brother kept moving his father around to keep Luke Cage away from them. James Jr., though, was eventually recruited by the criminal corporation, whose power-enhancing scientist, Dr. Carl Mollis, mutated him into a superhuman called Coldfire. And as Coldfire, James Jr. hoped to be a match for his superpower brother, whom he regarded as a threat. And he used this hatred of Cage as a focus for his new energy powers. James Jr. sucks. He does. Most people in comics with a Jr. suck. Hmm, I'm, I'm mulling that over. Because there's another James Jr. in DC Comics that's pretty there terrible is, as well. There is, who also sucks, yeah. <laughs> Though James Jr. worked with the corporation quite willingly, Malice had James Sr. held hostage as extra insurance of Coldfire's cooperation. And when Cage learned the co- uh, the corporation, excuse me, was apparently holding his family, he invaded their headquarters and battled Coldfire. <laughs> However, the brothers ultimately joined forces to rescue their father from Malice, and Coldfire apparently sacrificed himself to destroy the corporation's headquarters. Aww. Yep. Cage returned to New York and decided his heart was no longer in superheroics and became co-owner of the Gem Theater with his friend D.W. Griffith. Remember old D.W.? I do remember. Even an invitation from Iron Fist to join a new and expanded Heroes for Hire failed to interest Luke Cage. Yet, when the would when the would be world conqueror called the Master tried to not the Doctor Who villain called that him cool. Yep. The Master tried to recruit Cage as a spy within Iron Fist Hero for Hire team, destroying Cage's theater, Gem Theater, in the process. So, Luke Cage was curious about this, and he played along, Mm -hmm. and he decided to be the Master's mole inside the Heroes for Hire. The Master's mole. Yep. This was in the 1990s Heroes for Hire series that I first mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast. Oh, so you were saying that he's kind of a bad guy Luke in Luke Cage is kind of a bad guy in that series. Interesting. Yep. So Luke Cage joined the Heroes for Hire and served with them for some time while reporting to the Master. Mm-hmm. Cage himself even began to sympathize with the more benevolent aspects of the Master's goal. And the Master and Luke Cage seemed to generally become fond of each other. Weird. But in the end, Cage would not betray his best friend Iron Fist, nor reconcile himself to the tremendous loss of life the Master's plans of conquest would entail. And he ultimately helped the Heroes for Hire destroy the Master of the World's plans. Yay! Now, Luke Cage remained with the group thereafter, and he dated a fellow member of the Heroes for Hire, the She-Hulk. Yes, he did. And when the Stark Fukujawa Corporation bought out the Heroes for Hire, Cage and Ant-Man were fired... Because of their prison records. Scott Lang Ant-Man. Yes. Uh, the best yep. Ant-Man. Yep. And the rest of the team quit in protest. And also because the book had been canceled at 19 issues. Well, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Luke Cage was once again bitten by the hero bug. And he continued to share adventures with Iron Fist. Exactly. And other heroes. Briefly, briefly resuming his Power Man identity, he was hired by Moon Knight to join the Marvel Knights. Mm. But mere days after he joined, the group was dissolved following clashes with the forces of Tombstone and Fu Manchu. Fu Manchu. But after this, Luke convinced himself again that he needed to quit being a superhero and he invested his money in a very sound business venture called a bar. Oh, I was guessing a pyramid scheme. Nope. Uh, Pyramid skin was second on his list. (laughs) There you go. This bar was soon visited by a really sassy lady called Jessica Jones. Mm. And who is that, Ashley? Jessica Jones is the Brian Michael Bendis creation who starred in a series called Alias and was recently played by, uh, oh, I'm going to forget Ritter. her name. I was going to say Kristen Stewart. That was a wrong yep. girl. Uh, on the Netflix television show, she used to be a uh, sort of generic superhero. She is no yeah. longer. She is a detective. Yep. 
After a one-night stand with a drunken Jessica, now yes. a private investigator, Cage's life was briefly thrown into disarray by Joan's reaction to the fling. But the two made peace while working as bodyguards for Matt Murdock, whose public denial of his Daredevil costume identity cost him a bit of Luke Cage's respect. Luke Cage actually hated it. He wanted him to reveal himself just like he had. That is actually my favorite part of the Alias series is, is her little relationship with, uh, with Luke Cage. Interesting. I think it's very well done. Mm-hmm. Shortly afterward, Cage extended emotional support to Jessica when she was forced to revisit her past abuses by the villainous Purple Man. Mm-hmm. And Luke Cage's feelings for her grew. And when Jones revealed that she was pregnant from their one night stand, she and Luke Cage moved in together. Yep. Soon after that, Luke Cage was recruited by Captain America into a new ar- incarnation of the Avengers after a massive prison break on Rikers Island after proving, proving himself in the fight to Captain America. This was in the beginning of the Brian Michael Bendis new Avengers run. Yes. And after a while and a bunch of different other stuff, I'm going to skip a little ahead a little bit because I want to talk about this first. Okay. Jessica gave birth to their child, Danielle. Yes. Now, why was she named? Why was this baby girl named Danielle Ashley? After Danny Rand. Yeah. To his best buddy, Danny Rand, the Iron Fist. I remember when you asked me that in the Jessica Jones yep. episode and I didn't know. That is my favorite thing <laughs> in the Luke Cage. Pantheon. Danny Rand relationship mm. that he named his baby girl. After his best friend, Danny. I think that's so awesome. Well, he's lucky that his name wasn't like Norville or something. Like, Danielle <laughs> is a very nice mm-hmm. translation mm-hmm. of Danny. Oh, and uh, Jessica Jones and Luke Cage also got married. Yeah, yes. <laughs> also, also that. <laughs> yeah. Now, at the start of the superhero Civil War, Luke sent both Jessica and his daughter to Canada to avoid the superhero registration. Oh, yep. Canada. Though, they, he, though he himself refused to leave the country. S.H.I.E.L.D. forces came to arrest him at the stroke of midnight despite not having used his powers once since the act went into effect and he fought his way to safety with the help of Captain America, the Falcon, and Iron Fist, who was at the time posing as Daredevil. Yes. And, uh... (laughs) Was he? <laughs> Luke so Cage funny. became a dedicated member of Captain America's Secret Avengers until Captain America surrendered to U.S. authorities. Yeah. yeah now, yeah. if you've read that storyline, you know that Cap died. He did. He was shot. Luke Cage and Spider Man rounded up some of the remaining unregistered superhumans: Iron Fist, Soup Spider Woman, who was really actually the Skull Scroll Queen yes. of Aranke, uh, Wolverine, Doctor Strange, to form a new team of new Avengers. Taking refuge in Doctor Strange's Sanctum Sanctorum, Cage tasked the new Avengers with opposing the numerous escapees from the Raft Prison while uncovering and exposing the truth behind the Raft Breakout and exposing the corruption in Shield and Hydra. Okay. During this time, of course, Luke Cage proved to be a very effective field leader. Yeah. And after Doctor Strange's sanctum was stormed by the hood, hidden in his underworld of superhuman criminals, Luke Cage relocated the rest of his team to one of Iron Fist's least apartments. So they're in uh, Danny's, like, apartments, because Danny's rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But his wife and child took refuge with the Mighty Avengers, the official Iron Man team at Avengers Tower. Yes, they did. Angry that his wife had abandoned him with his child, he opposed her outside of the tower and her decision to register with the law and end all contact with him. Discovering that she had no intention of returning with him with their child due to the dangerous and unsuitable environment, Luke Cage stormed back to his team's new headquarters and he was very disturbed with Jessica Jones' decision. Yeah, it's it's a real it's a real like humanizing moment that you don't get in a ton of superhero stories that I think is nope. kind of nice. Uh, after a scroll ship crashed in the Savage Land, Luke took the new Avengers there, confronting the mighty Avengers. And during the battle, Luke ripped open the scroll ship only to have a large group of 1970s versions of several heroes, including <laughs> including himself, emerge claiming to be the real heroes. As yeah. of course is during the storyline Secret Invasion. However, they were soon exposed as scrolls, thanks to advice made by Reed Richards and. And the Avengers flew back to New York and they met up with other heroes to fight a final battle with the Skrulls and Central Park. However, Ooh. during the midst of the fight, Jessica Jones came into the battle and fought with the heroes and admitting that Luke was right about the Skrulls right then and there and apologize. And after the Skrulls surrendered, the Skrull that was impersonating Jarvis, the butler of the Avengers, mm-hmm. disappeared with their daughter, Danielle, leaving Jessica desperate and upset. Who may or may not also be a Skrull. Uh, nope. Uh, <laughs> after the battle ended, Captain America, who at the time was James Bucky Barnes, yes. he organized a meeting with the new Avengers at his home, offering it to them as their base of operations. And when Luke, Jessica, and Carol arrived at Bucky's home, the new Avengers contacted the Fantastic Four and Iron Fist to begin searching <laughs> for the baby Danielle. 
Meanwhile, with the rest of the new Avengers unaware, Luke asks Norman Osborn for help in their search, agreeing yeah. to do anything he asked of him. Osborn helped Luke Cage recover their, his baby, Danielle, and when Bullseye killed the Jarvis sc- Skrull, Cage reneged on his offer to serve Osborn and returned to the new Avengers and said, nah, nah, poopy pants, why am I at? Good for him. Yep. Well done. After Osborn was defeated in the comic book event Siege, Steve Rogers soon became the nation's top cop, taking over all Avengers organizations, and he offered Luke a spot on his official Avengers team. Unfortunately, Luke had no interest in joining up with another government-driven Avengers, and despite Steve assuring him that it was all on a voluntary basis, Luke considered taking that offer a step backwards. Interesting. As a solution, Tony Stark sold the old Avengers mansion to Cage for $1, which we actually had to borrow from Danny Rand, Iron Fist. Oh. Yep. And Cage was allowed to operate his own independent Avengers team with minimal interference from the government. He, his wife, Jessica, Iron Fist, and several other heroes soon moved into the mansion and set up shop, including Benjamin J. Grimm, The Thing. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I, lo- I love that, that he joins this Avengers team. Uh, Luke also took up the job of running the Thunderbolts program for Steve Rogers in order to give some superpowered criminals a chance to turn their lives around like he did. Nice. And in the Shadowlands storyline, when Daredevil suddenly returned to New York by building a castle out of the destroyed building, and he went crazy and wore a black costume, oh, yeah. Cage was one of the many street-level heroes who thought Murdoch was getting out of hand. When news that he had had a change of heart in his heroism when he was shown mercilessly killing Bullseye reached Luke Cage's ear, Power Man and Iron Fist went to confront Daredevil, but the Man of Fear retreated after a big, big battle. And later, while at Danny Rand's restaurant, the two conversed about Murdoch's growing insanity. Mm-hmm. And he went off and got better of course yes he did luke and his heroes for hire fought the plunderer and after spider-man intervened he and power man grabbed the coffee and he says that the heroes aren't doing enough to keep the world safe so he and his team now renamed the mighty avengers began fighting off thanos's invasion of earth and after the initial threat was over he officially declared the new assembled group to be avengers nice the mighty avengers was eventually forced to clue to close their operation after being sued by a morally inverted tony stark for using the trademark name avengers this of course was during the not so good storyline of axis and it's best forgotten Okay. Currently, Luke Cage has teamed up with his best friend, Danny Rand, the Iron Fist, to be a hero for hire again, and they're doing missions on the street. Cool. So that is all of the comic book history of Luke Cage. Let's talk about him in other media. Okay. Luke Cage, of course, as I said, he appears as a series regular in the 2015 Jessica Jones series played by Mike Coulter. Uh, the character is introduced as a bar ro- owner who runs into Jones during the course of the investigation. And, of course, he's getting his own self-titled series with Mike Coulter reprising the role. And Mike Coulter will reprise the role again in the Defenders Netflix crossover miniseries. Woo! Now, Luke Cage has also appeared in a bunch of Marvel cartoons. Most notably, the teenage iteration of Luke Cage appears as one of the main characters in the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon series. He's voiced by... That's weird. Yeah, but I, I like Power Man. He's voiced by Ogie Banks, and this incarnation is part of Spider-Man's original S.H.I.E.L.D. team, along with Iron Fist, White, <laughs> White Tiger, and Nova, and he adopts the Power Man alias as he feels that he should name himself after his powers. That's cool. Yep. And just to let you know, fun fact... A Luke Cage movie almost happened. A film adaptation of Luke Cage was in development in 2003 by Columbia Pictures Mm -hmm. with a screenplay penned by Ben Ramsey with A.V. Irad serving as producer. John Singleton was to direct. Now, Jamie Foxx and Tyrese Gibson were considered for the role, while at the time Dwayne Johnson... Isaiah Mustafa and Idris Elba expressed interest in playing Luke Cage. Literally any of those three men would have been better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, than Jamie Foxx. Yeah, 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 yeah. In May 2013, it was announced that the film rights for Power Man had reverted back to Net, uh, Marvel Studios, that and happened. that's how Netflix got a hold of them. And that's it. And now let's move on to the next section, the recommended reading. Where are we going to recommend you stuff to read? And you can find all of these if you go to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading. There's a nice little Amazon widget there. You click it. You read it, a little bit comes back our way. Yes, so you can get all these books that we suggest here. The first one I would suggest is Power Man and Iron Fist, the epic collection, colon, Heroes for Hire. Now, this collects Power Man 48 through 49, Power Man and Iron Fist 50 through 70. This is some of Danny and Luke's first team-ups. This is Luke in the 70s, probably his best era. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is them and has their classic Luke Cage flavor. Cool. Uh, the next collection is actually not published yet, but it's going to be coming out in a f- couple of months, and it may already be available to you if you're listening to this in the far, far future. And that collection is called 
Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and the Heroes for Hire Volume 1. This is the first ever collection of the 90s Heroes for Hire series for the nice. first time. And Luke is kind of a villain in it, if you like. And it has great art. John Ostrander writes it. Um, it is very much a 90s comic book, but it is one of the better Heroes for Hire's runs, so mm-hmm. I would I would go along with it. Cool. Um, and then lastly, I would suggest New Avengers Volume 1. Now, this yes. is not the New Avengers with Captain America and the Raft. This is the New Avengers that I was just talking about where Luke Cage buys Avengers Mansion for a dollar and Benjamin J. Grimm, the Thing, joins his team. It is Luke Cage leading a team of Avengers and they have goofy Avengers and like a lot of the Avengers are more humorous, but I really like it. And Brother Voodoo has a very strong uh, uh, character arc in this in this thing. So Sweet. there you go, uh, New Avengers Volume One. And now on to the discussion where we'll discuss stuff. Yes, <laughs> Ashley. Why do you think Luke Cage is still around in 2016? In the beginning, he's not really a strong character. He's a stereotype. Why did Luke Cage move past that? I'm going to devil's advocate and say that um, when many when many characters of color, when many female characters were first created, they are stereotypes. Uh, and, and, and particularly when they were created during the, the bronze or the silver age, because these were these were pulp. They weren't treated with uh, necessarily the same level of scrutiny that uh, some other mediums demanded. You could get away with having a less well flushed out character if they had a pretty good gimmick. Yeah, and that's what Luke Cage is, and that's what Iron Fist is. They're pretty okay characters with a good gimmick. And reading some of those early stories is really fun, but it's also really hard it's really at, tough. at the same time. Yeah. And like some of the stuff that you brought up, like it's. It's kind of funny because you're really uncomfortable, but like that was what was acceptable at the time. And I think I think Luke Cage has transcended for two reasons. Uh, one, because in the pantheon of African American heroes, he's kind of the top. I mean, when, is he? I, I mean, if you I, I think if you look at them, it's him and Black Panther. John, not John Stewart. Oh, John Stewart. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at Marvel right oh, now. Oh, just I'm Marvel. Sorry. I should have, I should have, I yeah, should have yeah. caveated that. In like, terms of Marvel heroes, I agree 100 percent with that answer. In terms of all comic book superheroes, I think there are some others there. There are, there are, but still, I mean, it's a, it's a limited, it's a limited pool. That it's you're, a very you know, small that you're number. Pulling from totally true. Um, and then I think the fact that when you hit like the 90s and you get this evolution of Luke Cage and he kind of reduces down to like the yellow T-shirt, he's bald. Um, and they flush him out and they make him a uh, he, he, he becomes a real person over the course of his publication history. And the greatest thing about Luke Cage is what's so great about Mike Coulter's performance as Luke Cage. He's the baddest guy on the street in that he can beat up any of you effortlessly. He protects his own. He doesn't mess with anybody's business. He only messes with his own business. He'll protect you. But he's also a really good human being. And he's surprisingly caring. And him and Jessica have a really tumultuous relationship. But he loves her. Mm -hmm. And he loves Danielle. And he loves Danny Rand. He does love Danny Rand. Um, They're hetero life partners. They are. And I think that because not only is he a character who, you know, sometimes single-handedly has to represent a whole, you know, a whole ethnic group and a whole social class when he started, um, that's very powerful and then the fact that he actually turned out to be like an amazing human being is very powerful well you just brought up hetero life mate so this fits very <laughs> well into my, <laughs> my my second question of discussion okay what do you like better Luke Cage solo Luke with Danny Rand the Iron Fist uh, or Luke with Jessica Jones uh, oh that's an interesting question um, I really like Luke Solo, interesting. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of caveat that I like Luke leading a team a lot. I like reluctant leaders. Um, like like the trope I like to go back is like Aragorn is a reluctant leader, but he's the best leader, so he has to be the leader. Mm-hmm. And I like that about Luke Cage. Like Luke is the best leader. He should be in charge a lot of the times. And I like that he doesn't want to be. And I think that the dichotomy of that is very interesting. Jessica Jones is just not one of my favorite characters. Um. Even though I do like her better when she's in a relationship with Luke Cage. And I just haven't read a, a super ton of the Power Man and Iron Fist. That's all. Okay. Tell me your answer. Danny. But tell me why. Um, because they are the argument that you bring up several times that they are both imperfect halves and together they make one solid being. Yeah, they make one real person. Because think about it. 
Luke's poor. Danny's rich. Mm -hmm. Danny doesn't know anything about people or common sense. Luke knows has so much street smarts. Yeah, he's the most street smart. You know, yeah. um, Luke Cage is all about being a bulldozer. Danny's about precision. Mm -hmm. They're perfect opposites for each other. Nice. And I mean, even if you want to go to the race thing, I mean, come on. I mean, literally <laughs> black and white. Yeah, they're so. a yin and a yang. Yeah. yeah so yeah. That, that's why it's Danny. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on into the last section of our podcast, the teaching tweet. Where in 140 characters or less, Jason is going to take a lesson from Iron Fist, be specific, and sum up everything he just taught us about Luke Cage. Sweet Christmas. <laughs> Luke Cage is the true power man, if you dig what I'm saying. That's it. Okay, Marvel Marketing, I'm going to give you a free idea right now. If you don't, you got to make them hashtag Sweet Christmas and have a little Luke Cage pop up at the end. I'm telling you. Sweet Christmas. It'll be the, the best thing you've ever They'll done. They'll probably do it with, with Luke Cage. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Um, that's it for uh, the entire Luke Cage um, Gay Cage lesson. Ooh, you covered a lot. There's a lot. Did you learn? Did you? Do you feel like you went to Harlem and back? Uh, I've been to Harlem <laughs> and, I, and, and, I, and I have left. So, yes, it was a similar. All right, cool. Experience. Do you think you are perfectly primed to watch the Luke Cage Netflix series now? Now, yes, yes. definitely. Right. Definitely. Cool. Well, guys out there, we hope you really enjoyed it. Uh, I had a lot of fun researching Luke Cage, and you learned that somewhere in the future, we're finally going to get to cover. And, you know, I love on this podcast where we talk about. You know, we discover like some of our favorite characters. Like, you know, I've said several times the Thunderbolts. Mm -hmm. You've brought up a couple characters, the Nightcrawler as well. You can tell. I love it when we find other characters that we really love that we haven't done geek history lessons on. Because yeah. listeners, if you cannot tell how itching at the bit I am to do the lesson on Iron Fist, mm -hmm. you do not know me. So much so that you mixed your metaphor. Yep. I don't <laughs> care. Whatever. All right. So, uh, guys, that's it for this episode of Geek History Lesson. Um, listen all the way to the end because we got cool stuff to go. We found out that a lot of people don't really listen to the end, especially like last week when we took the week off and we said we were taking the week off and everybody's like, why did you take the week off? And we're like, we talked about it at the end of the episode. Bah! All right. <laughs> So listen to the we end. sound exactly like that. Yep. So uh, subscribe and download the show on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud if you would, please. And go leave us a review on iTunes because it really helps us in the search algorithms. And we'll read your comments on the show because, like, Sweet Idiocracy said, What a treat! Five stars. It's so much fun to listen to how this podcast has grown and perfected its style. Aww. Jason and Ashley have a great balance of knowledge and playfulness, and you will sound like the coolest of your geek friends if you can pop out Silk's origin story at a cocktail party. Yes! West Coast <laughs> Avengers. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I love that. I love that people actually use this at cocktail parties. Sweet idiocracy. That was a really, uh, that was a really, really great Review. So go over to iTunes, be like Sweet Accuracy, blah, 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 and we'll uh, read you on badly on the show like I'm just doing right now and just blah, 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 making noises. Uh, Ashley, if they want to make future episode suggestions, like the amazing Anthony Russell who suggested us Luke Cage, where can they do that? Well, if you want to be like our TA Tony, you can head on over to geekhistorylesson.com or facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson. There's two or three ways to contact us in both places. That's right. You can find me on Twitter and YouTube at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N. You can find Ashley on Twitter at Ashley V. Robinson. Go over and follow our thoughts. Tell us how much you hate us over there and tell Ashley what Harlem is actually like because I'm not so certain she's actually been there. I've been there like 12 times. You tell her what Harlem's <laughs> really like, everybody. She needs to know. Uh, guys, I'm Jason Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson and Professor Jason. Please close out this lesson on Luke Cage. Oh, yeah, sweet Christmas. Just go ahead and pull those headphones out of your ears, pull that blanket up over your body, and make yourself a hot toddy as you sit there and relax and think about the power of man, Luke Cage. We'll be listening to you next week. We want you to listen to us. I'll listen to you as it becomes a hot, hot misty night next week. 